encourage your soul, enlighten your mind, and empower your faith. This is The Light Network. If you want to be a serious Bible student, a successful servant, and a powerful preacher, this is the podcast for you. Hello and welcome to Preachers in Training. My name is Robert Hatfield and this is the podcast where we talk about all things preaching and ministry. Welcome to Season 12, Episode 13, as we begin the descent of uh, Season Number 12. We're here at the end of 2020, if you're following along sequentially or chronologically, and uh, you know what 2020's been like, and that's the reason why it only seems appropriate that we spend a little time talking about positivity in preaching, positivity in preaching. Here to help us with this conversation is a pretty positive person, Dale Jenkins, joining us from uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee, of the Jenkins Institute fame, thejenkinsinstitute.com. Welcome back, sir. Thanks for being with us. You know, when I get an invitation to be with Robert Hatfield on preachers in training, it's like, this is the greatest thing in my life. Oh, you know, come on. Honor. Come on. The honor's all mine. I, I was thinking today, though, uh, you have always taken time for us and been so accommodating. I know you got a busy sky. I know you're busy even today. And uh, thanks. It, it always means a lot. Well, you're, you're kind. And again, I, I really mean it. It's just, I am so proud of, of of you and your family oh. and the work that you do. Well, and thank you. you. You bless a lot of lives and we're thankful for you. So it is great to be with you. And it's, you know, nowadays it's kind of great to be with anybody, anytime, <laughs> anywhere. anywhere yeah. isn't it? <laughs> however, however you do it, zoom, whatever podcast, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got um, to preach. I got to preach on the road not long ago somewhere. Oh, yeah? and it's like, I think I'm going to preach like six hours. <laughs> For real. Yeah, I know. I, I, think you were, I love preaching at Spring Meadows, though. It's been, that's been kind of a good thing in this year is, uh, you know, my my life has been totally encompassed in, you know, I don't I don't have drive time anymore, so I'm, I'm here all the time. So that's been, that's been good for the congregation, I believe. Good yeah. for me, too. Yeah. We learned to appreciate home a little better this year. Well, I think that we're beginning to see why uh, I, I wanted you to come on today to talk about being positive. Uh, you know what actually made me think about this? You you have, I think about you as a generally positive person anyway, number one, but lately I've noticed you've been doing Facebook posts about positivity of masks, and uh, those have been those have been fun. I've enjoyed that. <laughs> so I'm like everybody that's, that's alive right now. I, I positively hate masks. I just... <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you on some really good list right now because I, I you know, everybody says follow the science, they work, they work. Well, I don't understand if they work while we have more cases right now where I had in the nice. states that are restricted to mask have the most cases, <laughs> but I do wear a mask. Uh, a lot of people appreciate it wear a mask, but I do wear a mask and I wear it, uh, I wear it for others. I'm not very concerned about what happens if I get this, but I'm, mm-hmm. I am concerned about it if I give it away else. So I, I do wear a mask and what I, my, my practice is simple. If I go into any business, I wear a mask. If I, if I, uh, if I'm around people and any of them have a mask on, I put mine on. So that's, mm-hmm. that's my method of doing it. And that may not be the best way. I may be supposed to wear one even when I go to bed and sleep, but I don't, I just wear <laughs> one around people that have one on. So, but, but yeah, that's what started. I started thinking there are some positives about masks. So yeah. That's how I got started. I like that. Yeah. It, it's good stuff. Uh, you got to go check it out if you haven't seen some of those yet. It's, it's uh, enlightening stuff. Well, uh, positivity and the need to remain positive in preaching. There are some who would mistake positivity for being aloof, basically, as a preacher. In other words, you're emotionally distant and disconnected from all the bad stuff going on and, you know, the decline or X, Y, Z or the, you know, all the, all the stuff that's going on. There's certainly plenty of that. I guess I would assume we're talking about positivity in spite of the negativity that surrounds us. Why, just as we sort of lay the groundwork, why is positivity important and even desired for preachers? I mean, Christians in general, but preachers specifically today. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's really important nowadays. And, you know, I, I'll never forget, we had a guy visit our services one time at Spring Meadows, uh, been some time back. And uh, 
he and his family came and they visited a couple of times and seemed to like it. And they were asking questions. And then one time he came to me, he said, now, they are one of those positive churches, are you? <laughs> I said, no, not no, a no, terrible thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we hate people and <laughs> gospel and all. <laughs> so I, I do tend to be a positive person, but, but when we talk about positivity in, in the church and in preaching, it's not an, it's not a, uh, that 19, what, 58 movie Pollyanna. It's not a Pollyanna positivity. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's not an artificial. It's based upon something. Uh, if you want a quick sermon, Romans 8 is just such a fabulous chapter in the Bible. I think it may be the greatest chapter in the Bible. It's not, but they're all great. <laughs> but the, it, gives, it, gives, it gives eight reasons or seven reasons why Christians should be positive. I'll run through them real quickly because this is a preaching podcast. How about yes, that? absolutely. Uh, first one, verse one, uh, there's no condemnation of those who are in Christ. There's no condemnation, therefore no guilt. And so that should make me positive. Number two, verse two, through Christ, the law of the spirit set me free from the law of sin and death. I'm free. I'm not going to die like those without hope. I'm going to transfer from this life to be with God in heaven. That's plenty of reason to be positive. Number three, verse 26 is a powerful verse that I don't understand, but it says in the same way, mm -hmm. the spirit helps us in our weakness. And when we don't know what to pray, the spirit himself intercedes on our behalf with groanings and utterances. The spirit prays for us, takes our, our thoughts that we don't even know how to express to God and says, God, here's what he's trying to get across to you. Mm. That ought to make us positive because there are plenty of times I don't know what to pray. Number four, verse 28, we know that all things work for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that everything that happens in the Christian's life is good. That means that God can take even the bad in our life and use it for his purpose if we are with him. Hmm. Number five, verse 31. And what shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? My dad always said God plus one always equals a majority. Hmm. That's plenty of reason to be positive. Number six, verse 32, a tongue twister reverse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? You did that and well. That basically means if God loved you enough to send Christ to die on the cross, don't you think he loves you enough to care for all of your other needs? He mm. solved your biggest problem. You can be positive about everything coming down the hill. Mm. Number seven, verse 38. I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor things present nor things future nor any powers nor any height or death or anything of all creation shall be able to suffer us love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, if that's not enough reason for the Christian to be positive, he might ought to pack his Christianity up and take it to a, a Christianity fix-it shop and figure out what's going wrong in his life because that's plenty of reason for a Christian to be positive. Yeah, wow. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Amen. You can't argue with that. I, it's I Bible. Guess, yeah, it, yeah, in spite of it, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah it's Bible, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, living like that, you know, living it out is... is uh, Sometimes the challenge, right? And I think it is that, a challenge to say positive. Yes. Robert, I, I showed up at church Sunday, and uh, we 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 back two years ago after the shooting out in Texas, we put our back doors of our building on an automatic lock after nine thirty. Our services start at nine, okay. and that is the idea of keeping someone out that might be there for nefarious, nefarious purposes. Uh, so yesterday, I got to the building. And I had been in there for probably 30 minutes. I get there 30 minutes an hour early every Sunday. Our first people started showing up. Somebody kind of made me very upset. The back doors were locked this morning. They're not unlocked and you need to get that fixed. Uh, a few minutes later, someone else came in and we'd had an event at the building and they said the stage, something that was on the stage had been moved and they couldn't find it. They're very upset about it. And then I get a phone call from someone who is at home that said their name had been left out of the bulletin that they were sick. On top of that, over half of our members of our congregation were not present because they're in quarantine or self-quarantine. Mm -hmm. I tell you, it is a challenge to be positive for right now, but it's a challenge every Sunday for preachers. I'll never forget the Sunday that I almost hit a, a breaking point where I was, they were singing the song before I go up to the stage. I was standing in the back, I always stand back there to greet people that come late and everything. I stand in the back and we're singing the song before I get on the stage to preach the word of God. And a lady, a young lady, the young adult came up to me, irate. 
the the commode in the women's bathroom is not working. <laughs> and I thought, so what do I do about this? <laughs> and why are you telling me this? And she was just angry at the church because the commode was broken. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it is not easy to step in that pulpit with all the stuff, the baggage, the emotional, the relational, the mm-hmm. financial, the family baggage that we have in our lives every week to step in that pulpit and preach a positive message. It's not easy. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it comes out, doesn't it? I mean, sometimes our messages are not so positive. It's one thing to preach on sin, right? Although there's always the positivity of the hope that comes at the end, right? David Shannon has famously said now, and we've quoted it many times, you know, get to Jesus, the faster you can get to Jesus. And that's the positivity in in every sermon that we preach. Sometimes I've found myself accidentally, and then later I have to repent of it personally, carrying that into the pulpit, and then it's coming out through my voice and and over the speakers, and it's like I'm taking it out on everybody else when it shouldn't be, and I like to think I'm not alone in that, but we, 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 we can't let that be our MO. We can't let that be what we continually do week in and week out. It, I guess if we wanted to, it'd be really easy to focus only on that stuff and then rip people upwards and downwards every single week. Every week. Yeah. yeah. And then we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> I, I, was, I was preaching in Pocahontas, Tennessee when I was in college. I, I like was looking it. for a job while I was in college, you know, one of those Sunday gigs where you can preach every, every week. And yeah. A brother walked, I preached there one Sunday and after the sermon, a brother walked up to me, a little short, older man, way up in years, probably my age now, the age I am now. He was old. <laughs> super he old. Me, super <laughs> old. He walked up to me and he, he said, brother, you stepped all on my toes today. Good sermon. Can you come back next week? I went back the next week. After the sermon, he walked up, brother, you walked all over me today. I need that sermon. Good sermon. Come back next week. Came back the next week. Third week, he did not say a word to me. Didn't say anything. Didn't say, glad you're here. Didn't Mm. say, good to see you. Didn't say, good sermon. I never got invited back. (laughs) Apparently, I didn't step on his toes that Sunday. There's Uh some people that they only think preaching is good if they leave feeling bad. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not a good place to be in someone's life. Yeah, good point. All right, so how how do we... How do we stay positive in light of all the things? Um, I, I know you've got some thoughts prepared for us. We can get down to the practicality of this and try and encourage us to be positive people. And the reason why it's so important, right, for preachers to be positive, we're in many ways setting a tone, right? We, we get to be up there and, and speak in the Word of God. We want people to associate God's Word with positivity. We want it to be a positive experience. Uh, the church ought to be a positive place. In, in our role as leaders to the extent that we are. We, we want to exude that positivity and make it a positive experience. So that's why it's so important in spite of all that. We're written we down seven reasons, Robert, why it's important that we be positive in our preaching. You asked me to speak on positivity, to talk about positivity in yes. preaching. And I, I started writing down reasons why we should be positive. And so I wrote down seven reasons why our preaching should be positive. All right. And, all right. uh, so you ready? Yes, I'm number ready. Number one, you, you actually already said number one. Oh. But, but you didn't say it as directly as I'm going to say it. Good. Uh, your mood affects the atmosphere and the personality of the congregation. Whoa. As the preacher, as a guy who stands up every Sunday, the, the attitudes that you exhibit, the emotion that you exhibit in that pulpit, the way people hear you, that, mm-hmm. that is going to be the attitudes, emotions that they have in their life. And that congregation begins to, to develop that same personality. So you said, my mood. I mean, that that's pretty personal. So what what did you do that day when the lady came up and said the the bath the, you know the commode's not working in the ladies' room? I mean, how how do you make that transition in one song <laughs> to get up with a smile on your face and really mean it, not just you know faking it when you stand up to preach? So it, I don't I don't think it happens unless it happens intentionally in this. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it happens unless we've been to the other place. Mm-hmm. When we've been to the other side of this, when we've allowed that to get on us, and then it begins to bleed through in our preaching and in, in how we deal with people from the pulpit and, mm-hmm. and the compassion and love we have, when it begins to bleed through, and then we see that, or we don't see it, or someone points it out to us, at that point then we say, all right, 
I don't care what else is going on. I have a word from the Lord today. Yeah. I have a message from God's truth. I have good news. I have the gospel I'm going to preach today. And I, that has to trump everything else. I, so I'm, I'll tell you a quick story here. Uh, Dad had died. Uh, it's been a little over 10 years ago. Mm. And for about 12 to 18 months, uh, because of that, because of some events surrounding it, and because the congregation here at Spring Meadows was going through some really difficult years. We were still growing in numbers, but we had a lot of drama going on in the background. Hmm. And I get one Sunday afternoon, I get a, an anonymous email. And some have heard me talk about it. I still don't know how you send anonymous emails. <laughs> But the person said, and I had said something in the pulpit that day about frustration or, or, you know, how it's tempting to quit at times. And they started the email, I think you should quit. Hmm. And they said, you've turned negative, you're mean, and that's not good. Hmm. And I sat there, and I'm sorry, brothers, listen to this, and I just started crying. I don't want to be mean to anybody. I don't have a desire. I want to be mean the devil, maybe. I don't want to be mean to any person on this earth. I don't care how wicked and rotten and horrible they are. I don't want to be a mean person. Even mean people, I don't want to be mean to. Why would God's people want to be mean? And I repented at that time. And I thought, I am not going there again. And so how do you make this happen? How do, how do you do? How do you make your mood? Well, you make a decision. Listen, this is more important than the fact that I've got a power bill that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pay. Or this is more important than the mm. fact that I've got an elder that I think may want me to leave. Or this is more important that I got an email from someone that's angry with me. I'm talking about the precious, beautiful, lovely, life-giving word of God. I must be positive. Mm. Good point. All right, so realize the effects of your mood on the congregation. Uh, what, where do we go next? What's number two? So uh, it's one, one more thing on that. Okay. I, I said personality as well. I said atmosphere and personality. Oh. personality uh, I heard a guy say probably 30 years ago that over time, I think my dad may have said it, over about a seven-year period of time, from the time you move to place, over about a seven year, the congregation will develop the personality of the preacher. Interesting. So if you don't like your congregation, guess what? Uh, Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, that took a turn real fast. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, I do think there's some truth to that. I do think yeah. our, the way we do, the way we say things, what we emphasize for the pulpit will be what the congregation will emphasize, that sort of thing. Number two, you ready? Yep. Because our message is inextricably positive. Hmm. Uh, yes, there is bad news. Sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's only one verse in the book of Romans. Mm -hmm. If we linger in the sin, I believe that we degrade the meaning and the power of the cross. It is good news that we preach. Mm. And we must stay positive in our preaching because we are gospel preachers. I know guys that, that man, if you call them a minister, they get angry. If you call them evangelists, they get angry. And if you call them a pastor, they get angry. You call it, they call them. So I'm a minister of the gospel. They're, they're, they're angrily proud of that title. Mm. Angrily I'm a proud of the gospel. Mm. Yeah. I'm the preacher of the gospel. Well, you know, when you say that you're saying, you know, that you're saying good news. So our message cannot be negative. Even when we talk about sin, it's not negative. The truth about sin is that God won't sin out of our life and has provided the remedy, which is the most beautiful positive thing that ever has happened to man for that sin to be taken away. Our message can't be anything but positive. Mm. Yep, absolutely. Amen to that. All right, number three, are we ready for three? I'm ready for three. I'm ready for three. <laughs> you like the first two. I'm ready for three. Move on. You're, so good. You're, You're not so as ready as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe that most of God's people want with all their heart to please God. And we need to build them up on that. Hmm. Uh, Leighton wrote a book years ago called How to Grow a Great Church or something like that. A brother preached up in Oklahoma. And he said, we tend as ministers to dwell on and to be led by what he called the vocal negative minority. Hmm. And if we do that, we will the good people end up beat down 
And I've seen that over and over again. I remember a guy when the first congregation worked with, his name was Leon and Leon was a roofer. And uh, I remember I invited Leon to go play basketball with me on a Friday night. He was not much older than I was, but a couple years older than I was. I went to him, I invited him to play basketball with me. We had a great time. Then we went to eat at Quincy's. That's how long ago it was. All right. Went to eat at Quincy's afterward. And after we ate, he said, you know, he said, for years I came to church and every Sunday I would leave beat down. And he said, I felt like I could never be good enough. Well, I mean, we know as ministers, you can never be good enough. But the good news of the gospel is that we don't have to be good enough. We are saved not by our goodness. We're saved by the gospel, by the grace of God, Mm -hmm. when we accept and obey his good news. So uh, most of God's people, and and here's what I think happens, and it may happen to somebody listening to this podcast or watching this podcast. Here's what I think happens. We let a small minority in the congregation get in our minds and we become negative and we're always addressing their comments and their criticisms and their reactions. And there may be, you know, 95% of the church sitting out there thinking, I just love this guy that pre- I want him to just preach the gospel to me. I don't want him to talk about brother Joe. Everybody knows Joe's negative. Everybody knows Joe mm-hmm. is a person that brings people down. I just need to hear something good from the word of God. Mm. And so I believe most of God's people with all their heart want to please God. That's a reason to be positive and not let that two or three people in the church who are negative pull you down. Yeah. And I've found that that's, for me, at least, that's the key to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4 at the end of verse 2, after he says, you know, preach the word, you reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Uh-huh. And the patient aspect of that is, hey, listen, it, these people are imperfect like I am, and I give myself a lot of slack and a lot of patience and a lot of room to grow. And often I don't do that for somebody else because I'm assuming the whole church is filled with negativity and people who yeah. are stubborn in their impenitence. So, so yeah. if you ever get really blessed in your life, you'll be blessed when you come, when you get an eldership in your life that, that loves you enough to instruct you in a positive way mm. and to help you be better. And that's one of the greatest blessings in my life. I have an eldership and it took me a long time to get here. And mm-hmm. I don't want guys that don't have that in their life to feel bad about it. You'll get there eventually in all likelihood. It took a long time to get there. I had good elders before mm-hmm. all my life. Every church I've worked with, I've been blessed. There have been some bad elders, but good elderships. But if you ever get an eldership that they they realize, hey, I have we have a vested interest in you being a better preacher, and we're not threatening you or wanting you to leave. We just yeah. want to help you be better. And then you can invite that into your life, but you'll be blessed. And so my eldership will once a year meet with me, and they'll tell me things I need to do better. Hmm. And, and it's not a, you know, let's whip on Dell a little bit. It's uh we love you and we know you want to be the best you can be. And we want to help you be the best you can be. And here's some suggestions. And so a few years ago, they said to me, stop talking to the people that aren't here. Hmm. The people that are here are here because they want to be here. It's like, why do you have to say that truth that well? I mean, I don't like that. But I like talking to people. So they said, you're answering objections to people who have left us. Mm. And they're not even there to hear your answers to their objections. Your answers are really good. They're good Bible answers. But 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 you're not. they're not even here to hear those answers. And the people that are here, they don't have those questions. Talk to the people that are present. Oh. And I thought, man, that's, that's a truth bomb right there. <laughs> that's good stuff. Yeah. But allowing that into our lives too, rather than bristling up against it is, is a whole other challenge. <laughs> well, and, and so I think that's where preachers mess up a lot of times. Yeah. Is we see it as us against the elders. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, they really, they do have a vested interest in you being the best you can be, because if you're the best you can be, the congregation will do better. And so if you could take their suggestions, not as, and, and maybe you should say, now, are y'all telling me this because you want me gone? Or you're telling me this because you really want me to be better. Mm. And, and, and I don't think this is going to make me better. So let's talk through it and help me understand how it makes me better. Mm-hmm. And, and so I do that with my elders. And, and the great thing is Robert, that a few years ago, I, I asked them, I said, y'all are helping me. And I know y'all want to be the best you can be. Do you mind if periodically I share some things with you? Hmm. And because I had responded well to what they suggested to me, they accepted my suggestions on some things. 
And uh, boy, that's that. I don't know if you can do that until you're about 50 years old, but at some point <laughs> in your life, uh, you, you get to be a point where your elders are your age and your peers kind of, you begin <laughs> to be able to, to talk to them a little different. Yeah. All that. right. All right. So I thought, what are we on? Number four now? Number four. Man, you're keeping up well. I am. I'm taking notes. We should be positive in our preaching because <laughs> people respond to positive. Hmm. People respond to positive. Uh, I, I coached, uh, so I, I, I love sports. Uh, I played football and basketball, ran track and played tennis, uh, but I was never good at baseball. I now know it's because I have some eye issues that wouldn't let me see the ball as it was coming in right and because I'm kind of uncoordinated in certain ways. <laughs> and so best, baseball <laughs> was not my sport. But uh, my younger son, Andrew, loved baseball. And so I ended up coaching some baseball. And I remember one time going to a game, and we had this boy on the team. His name was uh, Jacob. And Jacob was on the team, and Jacob always struggled with confidence. And I, I couldn't get him to be confident. He had some real good talents. He could have been good, but he had no. And so I went to a game one day, and his dad was in the stands. And his dad, this boy was maybe 10, 11 years old, maybe 12, that age. His dad, from the stands in a ball game was cussing his son hmm. and talking about how it was no good. And he's right. And you're horrible. And you can't hit, you know, blank, blank, blank. I mean, just, I, I, I had enough of it. And as nice and kind as I am and try to be, I walked up in the stands. I sat down beside the guy that I never met before. And I told him my name and I said, I'm a preacher and I'm not here to preach to you because I'm a coach and I'm coaching your son. And your son's a pretty good ball, ball player. But if, if, if you don't stop cussing him, I'm going to have the officials here escort you out uh, because we don't allow profanity in this park from the fans. It was a small town. We don't allow, and they didn't. It said no profanity. There was a sign up. Had a list of rules. Well, I was no profanity. So we don't allow profanity in this park. And your son doesn't need to hear that. And I said, here's what it makes me think. If you cuss your son in public, I wonder what you do to him in private. And, and, I, and then I closed by saying, and the truth is, if you'd say some good things to your boy, he'd probably blossom. Hmm. Well, you know what's true of that boy is probably true of most people on earth. People respond to positive. They don't respond to negative. Now, now they get a reaction to negative. People react to negative. But true change does not come because people think they're going to go to hell. That may, uh, that may cause a little bit of change. But true change comes when people realize God loved you enough to send his only begotten son into the world to die for your sins. That's the love of God. Mm. Yeah. That's what do we respond to? We respond to positive. When you're preaching, think about that. I preach some really, really hard negative lessons. But even the negative lessons I preach, I preach from a positive slant mm -hmm. that this can be fixed, that there is a way to salvation. There is a right way to go, that we can do better in this area. People respond better to positive. Mm. The goodness of God leads you to repentance, right? Romans 2, 4. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And then, of course, you got the, the Jude verse, you know, some saved with fire. But it's not all <laughs> you're saved with fire. I mean, you know, it's, it's not, everyone's once while a little fire helps. But, uh, That's okay. right. All right. <laughs> so people respond to positivity. Number five. Number five, because uh, we as ministers, as preachers, often have to deal with people at their darkest. And if we're not careful, that darkness can overtake us. And I think we should work mm. at being positive in our outlook and attitude to ministry and to preaching because we can be pulled down into that darkness. I mean, we deal with people who, are, who have drug issues and and moral issues of all sorts and have messed up their lives. I ask elders sometimes, hey, what have surprised you most about being an elder after they've been an elder for a year or two? What surprised you the most? About? And often I get the question, I get the answer, I never knew how much people mess up their own lives. Hmm. Thought, That's a great answer. Yeah. Uh, you begin to realize, as a preacher, you see it all the time. And, and so you're dealing with all the negative in this world and everything. You can be drawn down into it. So let me pause because we are going to, by the nature of our work, hear a lot of the dark, a lot of the negative. And so we must push forward through it and not let that overtake us in our lives. And again, as you said earlier, being proactive in positivity, otherwise it will, the negativity will overtake us. So need to have some 
some practices in place, some ways that you disconnect sometimes and, and other things. And then in your thinking, to your point here, our attitude needs to be one of positivity and hope so that we don't get sucked into the other. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number six. Well, I asked a preacher friend of mine uh, for, uh, for anything. I read on my six points that I had then. I asked him, you got anything else? And he said, because the church needs the church. And I thought, I'm not sure what you mean. So I asked him, he said, well, he said, the, the church by its very nature is, is a positive thing. Uh, and if we're not careful, we can allow our churches to become negative places. And I, I, I pray to God that in people's lives that they will have the opportunity to be at a church that, that is not a place that you dread to be every week. And he said, we should be positive in our preaching because the church needs to hear that so that they can be the church that God means for them to be. The church needs the church. I thought, okay, I'm still not exactly sure what you mean, <laughs> but it, it seems to fit. It tracks well. It, it strikes me. We spend a lot of time, and we should, preaching a restoration of the doctrines of the New Testament church as a pattern. But I think we also ought to preach restoration of the attitudes of the New Testament church as a pattern in their their love and, and to this point the positivity is is definitely there. Yeah. I have preached and I do preach and I will continue to preach the identifying marks of the church. Yes. I believe that's a Bible thing to preach, okay? I believe it with all my heart. But I only know of one place where Jesus gave the identifying mark of the Christian. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples. Here's the identifying mark, that you love one another. So, yeah, I, I, yes, sir. We, we got to preach that identifying stuff. But until we restore the attitudes of the first century church, we've not reached restoration. Yeah. All right. Realize the effects of your mood and personality on the congregation. Uh, I understand that our message is inextricably positive. Most of God's people want to please God. People respond to positivity. Uh, be positive is proactivity against the darkness of ministry overtaking us. And because the church needs the church. What's our final point of observation today? I need you to send those points to me. You did, really. You, you worded them better than I have. Number seven, okay. <laughs> and, and this goes back to your initial question. And that is because there's enough negative in people's lives right now. Uh, there is enough negative in the media right now. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I am as apolitical as you can possibly be. I, I hate politics. Uh, God did not intend to save the world through a political party, but through the son of God. Uh, and, and we have some Amen. people out there that it seems in their mentality, they think God's going to change the world through politics. Yeah. The thing that will change this world is the gospel. Politics will not change this world. I do know there's good politics and bad politics. I still hate politics. I've never seen when the church gets involved in politics for it to be positive. So when I'm at home studying, and I've done that more this year than ever before, when I'm at home (laughs) studying, I will have the television on in the background over to my left. And what I do is I watch the news channels. I keep the sound low. I watch the news channels. And every hour I change to a different news channel. Hmm. So I'll watch an hour of, of MS or, or uh, uh, CNBC, which is a business channel. I'll watch an hour of Fox. I'll watch an hour of MSNBC. I'll watch an hour of CNN. And I'll watch, and then I'll just kind of about every hour I'll change it. And somebody says, well, you crazy. Well, I guess I'm going to be a little schizophrenic as a result. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> but what I've learned is that every one of them are negative. They're all negative. They're negative toward something or someone. It's, it's the people on the other side, uh, you know, which whichever it is, they're negative toward the other. Now, sure, as I say that, somebody say, well, what I watch is that they're fair. Uh, mm-hmm. they're not. I mean, they're all, they all have their agenda. Uh, and if the church ever gets, gets uh, I don't know the right word, but uh, overtaken, sabotaged by a political mentality, the church will not better do its work well. But what I've seen in that is that if you, that people right now are staying home more, they're watching more media and it's an election year and the media is negative. And with the, with the media and with the virus and with the general culture of, 
of rebellion and revolt that we have going on right now in our country. Mm -hmm. People have enough negative in their life right now. There's enough negative right now. And we need to be positive because there's too much negativity in the world right now. The Mm. church should be a positive place in people's lives. So many people have said, uh, I'm, I'm coming to worship to get away from the news cycles, to, to get, you know, to clear my mind of all of this. And isn't that the way it ought to be? I mean, the Bible's relevant, and, and certainly as preachers, we, we seek to speak into the lives of people who live in that culture, even as we do. But it's a nice reprieve <laughs> to step away for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and say, I, it, this is about God, and we can get away from this negativity. You know, we get in our mind, we have to address something. I, I, yeah. Maybe I'm not, maybe I'm the only one that does that. But I can remember back, what, 20 plus years ago when Bill Clinton had the relationship with Monica Lewinsky that was inappropriate mm. and sinful that I announced on a Sunday, next Sunday, I'm going to address this. I thought it needs to be addressed next. And I had a, a math professor, PhD math professor come to me afterward. And he said, you know, I hear that. Everywhere I go, hmm. please don't talk about that here. We know it was sinful. Please talk about something other than that. And so the next week, I talked about David and Bathsheba. Uh-huh. And I never mentioned okay. Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. I just talked about sin and what it does. And I talked about righteousness and what it does. And I talked about repentance and what it does. And rather than talk about but other than addressing media directly, mm-hmm. people have enough of that in their life right now. Yeah. You know, I know some guys right now, they think we've got to address the racial thing. Well, you know, there are people probably won't like what I'm going to say right now, but for 40 years now, I've addressed the racial thing every Sunday. Mm. When I stand up and I preach, here's how God loves everyone. Here's how every Christian ought to treat every other person in the world. I'm not addressing Black Lives Matter. I'm addressing every issue in the world of how you treat other people. And yes, that ends up being a part of that. Without me getting down in the gutter and fighting a fight that that I'm not going to win because it becomes politicized, I'm just going to teach people that you love each other, that you treat each other right. Oh, but I got to be relevant. Man, when you preach the word of God and you you apply that to people's lives, you are relevant. Mm -hmm. And, and that'll be way more relevant than whatever you tried to, to spin together, you know, to make it relevant for the culture. <laughs> yeah, there are some real stretches going on right now. There some, you go. There. That's right. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. And I know you got to run, but the seven things that we can do to be positive people and positive preachers, we appreciate so much uh, what you do with the Jenkins Institute. And uh, just a quick plug there. You got to go and check it out, thejenkinsinstitute.com and the 2021 uh, study devotional books. And uh, this has sort of become a tradition for you guys over there at TJI. Yeah, this is the fourth one. It's kind of neat to be a part of that. Hopefully people look yep. at that, thejinxinstitute.com. And Robert, uh, I love you and Emily and 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 your work. And, and I love the Light Network and what you are doing. And uh, I know it's been a difficult year for anybody that's trying to be a doer. But uh, thank you for all that you do. Keep doing well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, brother. And a quick reminder to you that uh, you can find out all about our podcast from the Light Network, of which Preachers in Training is a part, on our website, thelightnetwork.tv. And if you're looking for more episodes of Preachers in Training, scroll down to the Preachers in Training image, our uh, podcast artwork, where you will find all of the episode archives, including the last episode, Season 12, Episode 12, the 2020 Holiday Gift Guide for Ministers with Chad Landman, and uh, a preacher's Thanksgiving devotional with Dan Winkler before that, on and on. Great episodes this season, but really all of the seasons have been wonderful. We have, uh, oh, I don't know how many, over 100, close to 200 or plus episodes in our episode archives. When We want you to uh, enjoy those and benefit from those. Quite a few of them, uh, in fact, the majority of them, would still be just as appropriate today as they were when we originally recorded them. We are uh, producing more video episodes now than ever before, and so check out our YouTube channel as well. You can search for Preachers in Training on YouTube, or you can get to those by going to our show notes, thelightnetwork.tv. Look for Preachers in Training. 
Brand new episodes release every Thursday from that website or from your favorite podcast player or on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And we are actively planning season 13. If you've got episode suggestions or comments about the future, I would love to hear those. You can send an email to preachers at thelightnetwork.tv or... You can go to our Facebook group, facebook.com, search for Preachers in Training in the search bar. It's a closed group, as uh, I'm sure you are aware by now, but if you ask to be admitted, we would be happy for you to be a part of that. We do uh, really try and keep the conversations to preaching and ministry. And so uh, we we ask you to abide by that. We ask others who are part of the group to abide by that. It's not the place to you know share your live stream or market or anything. It's all about preaching and ministry. And so we would love for you to be a part of that, and I think that would be a group that might be beneficial to you and your ministry and preaching as well. Coming up next week on Preachers in Training, as we uh, near the end of this season, we have two final episodes, and Mike Vestal from Midland, Texas, will join us for both of those as we discuss takeaways from 2020. What do you think about that? Takeaways from 2020. What can we learn and uh, how to be, yes, positive in the midst of those takeaways. Let's be constructive and use what we've learned to make us better for the Lord and for his people in the future. That's next episode of Preachers in Training. Until then, I'm Robert Hatfield. Thanks for being with us. Let's go preach the word.